long time ago, back in 2019, the World Ninja League, at the time dubbed the National Ninja League, announced the Pro Series, something that, by label, never really came to fruition. What happened? It evolved into many major events that the World Ninja League has since been running, including the Gauntlet Pro Tournament and the upcoming World Ninja League Premier Series. Today on the World Ninja League podcast, we discuss all of these topics and some more with some special guests, Alex Cunningham and Gauntlet two-time champion, Joseph Meisner. Guys, thank you for joining me today. Of course, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. All right. I had nothing better to do. Of course. Alex Alex needs a life, so we're we're just kind of filling really in the time. And uh, and Joseph wants clout. So I also want clout. Yeah. This is the we're the, we're the best league for clout, obviously. Um right. now I did want to ask because as we were saying, you know, these pro challenges have, have really evolved into very different things before um Alex brought up he was doing the pro tournament, which was a, a web series of sorts that was that was during the pandemic, wasn't it, Alex? Uh, we had a couple of different ideas for pro tournament as a way of keeping ninja competitions going through the pandemic and through just the evolution of those ideas not really working out. We really like to fall upwards here at the WNL, as you will find out over the course of the next however long this episode takes. Um, it became kind of its own thing where it started as like a pandemic era thing and then by the time it actually came to fruition um we had started to come out of the pandemic but it was still a nice nod to you know everybody's home gyms and backyard courses and um but to answer your question yes and no started because of the pandemic fair and uh shortly following the pro tournament we had what I would argue is the biggest event that uh, this league has, has had, which is saying something because Worlds is pretty big. But we had, the, we had the gauntlet, and the gauntlet is crazy. Uh, as an outsider looking in at the time when gauntlet was being made and when the event was being held, I was, I was very impressed. Um, but I wasn't there. You guys were. So, so Joe, why don't you break down... Um, your experience with Gauntlet at, on, on the competitive side of things, because you, you've you done pretty much everything that you possibly could at that tournament. Right, yeah, so Gauntlet, I mean, my answers might be a little biased here, because I've done a little bit, done pretty well there. Uh, but yeah, for Gauntlet, dude, you show up there, and it's just terrifying. You got, like, this giant, like, monster of trust sitting there. Like, this trust is huge, the obstacles are huge, it's, like, super high in the air, the just the whole feel of the dirt around the water like everything is insane right so it's just a really intimidating as an athlete just when you show up there to compete right and then as you're competing through it side by side right head to head racing so there's a few spots where it's different from a normal ninja competition usually you're just going through obstacles uh but this one uh, the other person you're racing, right, can kind of influence your run depending on what they do, what they decide to, uh, if maybe they're going faster, they hit something, it wobbles a little different. So uh, I think the mindset's a little bit different too compared to most competitions, and it's more of a strength element compared, uh, like there's a lot of technique-based things in many other competitions, but this one, uh, the gauntlet, right, everything's more strength-based and endurance-based. So you kind of know what you're trained for going into it, which makes it a little bit more exciting competitively. Like if you have a lot of people training exactly what they're about to compete on, like you're going to have some really good head-to-head racing going then. Absolutely. And I would say that was definitely more so the case with Gauntlet 2. Much tighter. It was a speedier course as well. So you could still, it was still very, very pumpy and you could tell, but the times themselves were so much faster. The one thing that, that really stuck out to me when you would run, Joe, was your rope climbs at the end. Break, break down your, your technique or your thought process there because even when you were behind and you were the second person to get on that rope, you pulled through. Right, yeah, I don't care if someone's like 100 feet ahead of me, like I'm running my own race. When I get to that rope, I'm just going ham. And uh, for the rope, I actually have three different techniques that I put into it. And the first one is I slide, I put my leg over the rope and I slide down super, super fast. And it burns a hole in my leg, so I still have scars from that. And, but it gets you down, like, super quick, right? And then once you hit the bottom, like, you bottom out on the very lowest point of the rope, 
then you could swap your feet back and forth as you pull a little bit, right, like a horizontal rope climb. And then as you get high enough towards where it starts becoming a regular rope climb, right, more vertical, then you can switch your technique to a regular rope climb. So whenever, I didn't care if I was like, you know, two obstacles behind, I was like, oh, it's fine, I can make it up on the rope because I have this technique and I, ha I still have strength. I wasn't really tired by the time I got there. So it was just like, I, can I do the rope climb really fast? I know I can. So I just go ham every single time. Yeah, and it paid off. Hey, course record, right, Alex? He had, he had the course record? For both of them, I think. Jeez. Absolute legend. Did, did, ever, did we ever tell you how the rope came to be? No. I can't, I don't know how you don't know this story because you talk to I, Phil and I so much. Um, <laughs> may, maybe you'll recall it. Um, by the way, feel, feel free to stop me if I'm interjecting with too many stories. No, no, go ahead. So, um, Chris can bleep me out if I say too many IPs, but um, the same guy that created Sasuke uh, created a show called Viking on a different network. Kane's oh. Kane's eyes are lighting up. Okay, I, I it clicked now. It clicked. So their final stage, obviously in a lot of places, the final stage is to rope climb. They had a horizontal rope, kind of like the one that Gauntlet, that like followed by a vertical rope, and they had like a joint or something that just made it, you know, cut it at a 90 degree angle. And so um, Philip and Chris were talking about um, final obstacles because we didn't want just to, you know, plain old rope climb, and we came through a number of different ideas, and we were trying to figure out the one that would be the coolest, but, you know, logistically the most possible, because, like, obviously, you know, you ask Philip and I to come up with obstacles, and we're going to start with something that's, you know, beyond ridiculous. Um, so Philip suggested that, and Chris said, you know, it's probably not possible, and so Philip says, well, why don't you just use one rope, so that kind of just does a curve. And it ended up working out, and we called it Heavenly Ascent because I, I think this was a Chris idea. Um, because it is so high off the ground that if you fall, you will go to heaven. Because you will go. <laughs> thankfully, no. I mean, I mean, obviously, like everybody was jumping off the top of the tower, so it was incredibly safe. But yet, not yet. Puts a whole new uh, perspective on on the word heavenly. There, that was not that was the opposite of where I thought that one was going. <laughs> You said heavenly ascent. I was like, yeah, because they go up to the heavens. They're like, no, it's if right. you fall. Well, there there were there have been a couple <laughs> obstacles over the years that have used heaven. Um, I think heavenly rope was technically one of their rope climbs yeah. on Sasuke. V Viking had a heavenly climb, yep. same kind of idea. Um, so, Alex, I've seen the video that you're talking about with the ropes that zigzag across as you go through. I believe I watched, I think it was Nagano do it. It was yep. many, many. And yeah, dude, now I know it's the only one. I haven't thought about that until you brought it up, but that looked like the most grueling, like, final stage because your arms are just so tired that you can't even move, like, horizontally. Like, it's not like you're even going up. You're just kind of chugging along. And the the last the last rope of that final is only 10 meters long, and Nagano had 50 seconds. And for those of you at home, if Kane leaves this in, which I hope he does, um, who know Makoto Nagano, who's, like, one of the strongest competitors of all time, and has beaten 10 meter rope climbs in like 15 seconds, his limbs locked up because of how tiring that horizontal rope was. So he had 50 seconds and couldn't do it because like he physically couldn't move because of how tiring that was. And that was, you know, a lot of how we, I mean, we didn't want anyone's limbs to lock up because we didn't want anyone getting hurt, but like we wanted that same kind of fatigue at the end of the course. And I think we really achieved that because like, in a lot of races, especially in the open qualifiers, um, that happened a couple of weeks before the first gauntlet, we saw a lot of people pump out on that rope. And a lot of races were decided time to that rope because both athletes weren't able to complete it. And oftentimes, you know, one athlete was able to come back because they were actually able to complete the rope. So now we know the origin of the final obstacle of gauntlet. Uh, and, and that kind of brings me on to my next topic, the course itself. Um, I spoke to Josiah Papel in our first episode of this podcast, and one thing that he mentioned was that the course was very hot. Joe, can you uh, shed some light on that? Oh, man, I can expand on this. So, all right. It was like 
end of July. I don't know why they filmed Gauntlet end of July. That's like the worst time of the entire year in New Jersey to film it because it's like 100 degrees every day. And it's so humid. It's like terrible. Uh, but I love it, right? Like, I love that kind of weather. That's what I, I that's, that's my thing, right? So the entire like two months leading up to that, I would wear like a winter coat or like at least a heavy sweatshirt, and, like sweatpants and ma- like multiple masks so I couldn't breathe. And, uh, dude, it was, like, and then just training in that, like, so when I got to Gauntlet and it was, like, 100 degrees, it felt really cold, right, compared to what I was used to training for. Because I was, like, really hitting it hard for a couple months. And uh, as I was doing that, too, my hands always get super, super slippery. And I, to that point, I was always overusing chalk. And I don't know if you remember. Oh, uh, for, oh there we oh, go. My bad. No, you're it's good. Scott. Um, yeah, anyways, so <clears throat> I would wear all these things, right? I was training insane, like it was really hot in the gym. And yeah, so my hands, right? My hands were getting really slippery. So I was training for a couple months with my hands super slippery and without any chalk at all. So you remember the first gauntlet tournament, I had to like hang there for like 10 years and chalk up before I could continue. Chalk, chalk yeah. Yeah, like a you know, garbage, right? So I didn't want to have that happen again. So I just like was dealing with it. And when I got to Gauntlet the second time, I was, my hands were so used to hitting everything just covered in sweat that I didn't even use chalk in the second one at all. Like my hands felt completely dry. I was used to everything feeling burning hot. And I was already acclimated to like over a hundred degree weather, right? Cause I was wearing, you know, coats and sweatpants and all this stuff, right? And just training, running Gauntlet courses in it. And uh, all that training kind of was, I think, the only thing that really, really got me through it. Because, like I said, it's super, super hot, and not not everyone dealt real, well with it. And uh, I have a little bit of uh, advantage because I love the heat. But uh, yeah, definitely lots of training and preparation goes went into that to make it work out. That that first gauntlet, one of my keys partially melted. Because I left it in my car. It was like 95, I think, that day. Wait, your metal key melted. So it, it like, kind of bent, which actually worked out because the key to get into my apartment building and the key to get into my apartment looked the exact same. And one of them kind of went, like, uh, so now I can tell the difference. That's why my keys are This is some hardcore <laughs> stuff, man. What in the world? <laughs> this is crazy. Oh, you figure it's 95 degrees outside. It's 100 and something in car that has right mm. um were you at least covered alex when you were doing commentary or was there were you in the shade or were you kind of just out in the open we um i think you have the original footage will and i would do our take and then we'd hurry up and put a hat and sunglasses on because we literally couldn't see the course it was like I mean, again, we were, we're using shiny aluminum. The metal was literally just coming directly into our eyes. And you can tell in the takes, like, I'm commentating like this because there's, you know, a, the literal sun you know, being redirected into my eyeballs. Um, no, it was so hot. Uh, shout out, Chris, by the way. I talked him out of making us wear suits. That's why we have these nice polos. I talked him into it because um, I was watching ESPN one day and they were showing like beach volleyball or something, so, something outside this golf. I don't know. They show weird stuff sometimes. Well, um, no, not against this golf. This golf is awesome. This oh, golf, this golf, is great. Disc golf rocks. It really does. It, you know, it's just not something they show on ESPN every day. So they were outside, but they were wearing like ESPN branded polos. I'm like, well, just put us in. You know, brand polos, we have the logo, we look official, and, you know, we're not dying in 95 degree heat. Totally fair. I was going to say, like, Barbados must be... You won Barbados too, right? Yeah, man, because it's hot there, right? Yeah. And humid. It's like, dude, it's not even like... Bro, it's like walking into a sauna, but, like, you know how a sauna isn't hot? Like, it's right. like 85 degrees, but you're still dying somehow, right? Because right. there's, like... Moisture and air. Right. So, Barbados Airport, you don't have, like, a walkway. You just walk off the plane on the stairs, so you open the door, and when you walk outside, you just start dying. And it takes you, like, three or four days to quit dying, and then you could actually do, like, normal stuff. 
and then you got to run a course where you're, you know, your breathing's acclimated to normal activity, not like running yet. So that's like that's a whole nother level than. than I health. am I am immune to humidity, so I'm I'm ready for it. <laughs> I really want to do it. Maybe not this year, but I want to do it next year. Oh, dude, you gotta so. go. You gotta know, just like book the flight. And, like, yeah. Just show up, dude, and like. Chris and I have been saying that for six consecutive years. So maybe someday. Dude, someday it doesn't happen. Today you go there, but the flight. Well, if we go there today, there will be nothing there. I'm well, just gonna be like way too busy. <laughs> I know. Make a decision today. That way you forget about it, and then when it comes up, you're like, "Well, I'm already there. I have to yep. go now." So. I I wanted I wanted to go this year, but I'm getting married like a month after, and I'm like, I got, I got way yeah. too much to save up for. I can't be flying to Barbados right now, but. Yeah, man. Yes, thank you thank you i talked to flexing on two single guys yeah no um i can't i can't speak for joseph um but no like it was funny because i just i talked to her about it and i was like hey you want to go to barbados like it'll be a really nice getaway and also and also i'll do a (laughs) i'll do a competition before the wedding um wait what honey son uh, it's a vacation that happens before the wedding. Oh, no. I made that. It's trademark. Okay. Copyright me. Honey son. Okay, yeah, I get it. it now. It didn't click with me for a couple seconds. But yeah, well, no. Like, it, just do a destination. She's like, she's like actually down because now she, it, it's, it's gone from like, yeah, I want to compete in Barbados to her being like, I want to go to Barbados. <laughs> I was like, sure. Bro, you can rent a car, you drive on the other side of the road, and there's circles everywhere, and it's just like, dude, it's insane. It's so much fun though. All right. I'll keep that in mind. Next year. Next year, I'm likely making the trip out because I want to. Shifting from Gauntlet and Barbados and and all of our other amazing events for WNL, uh, we do have something coming up after the World Championship, um, and that is going to be our Premier Series. It's an entirely new uh, competition for our league, and the format of the qualifiers has been released. Alex, why don't you uh, educate some people who might not know what that is yet? Of course. So one of the things we want to get out of Premier Series is we really want to see the best out of every athlete. So we have two different courses that they're going to run. One is the placement course, which is your standard flow course uh, scored up until your first ball, the you know traditional form of ninja. And then we have the new challenge course, which is based off of the challenge skills that you've seen at Worlds or at some of your local skills events. So the great thing about the challenge skill is that you get multiple opportunities to put up your best run. And that gives us really the best of the best of the athlete. Because, you know, and almost everybody who's listening to this podcast has done Ninja at some point in their lives. And we all know it, you know, stinks to fall early. So this really gives us the best of those Ninjas. Um, the challenge skills were one of the most positively responded to things at the World Championship last year. And we think that integrating it into the course, which I say we, I, as, as of the time of recording, I'm not employed by the World Ninja League, but Chris and I talk about these things because we're such good friends. Um, it really gives us the opportunity to showcase the best of the athlete in a format that we think will be really engaging for our viewers. Because one of the things we want to get out of Premier Series is having a high quality of presentation that we think a lot of people in and out of the community will enjoy. So we think that that challenge skill uh, is really positive for the athletes. The athletes like it, and we think the viewers are going to like it too. Yeah, so I, I personally really like this format. Uh, I think it's it's very simple to understand uh, while also allowing for fairness in the competition. Um, I, I have a lot of friends, and they've, they've whiffed some obstacles before that they really, really shouldn't have. And, and those extra attempts will give them uh, the opportunity to make up the difference, which I think is, is something that's very important. Um, I personally am I'm more of an old school ninja fan. Uh, I, I've always been more of the, the one and done type of deal. But at the same time, um, that's just not the sport. You know, it, it, it's I like that we have it for the seeding round. And I like that we get to see as close to perfection as possible while still allowing the maximum amount of effort and opportunity for the athletes. Uh, so I, right. I, I'm, and I'm really, I'm really enjoying this. And you and I, I mean, we've been around forever. We're always going to have a place in our heart for the, you know, old school style of ninja. And of course. 
you know, one of the things Chris and I talk about is, you know, keeping that old school spirit of ninja alive because that's what got us both hooked into this sport. Um, but I think you and I both agree, having seen as much ninja as we have, that the leaderboards for ninja, and I mean, it's true of all sports, but especially ninja, the leaderboard like one, two, three are not necessarily the first, second, and third best ninjas in the competition. And they're not, maybe not even the first, second, and third best ninjas on the course because one of them gooped something early. Uh, the full course, for instance, gives us the opportunity to test athletes on each obstacle in isolation. And, you know, that's in its first season. And we think that uh, the challenge skill is kind of a best of both worlds in a way. Uh, you get the flow course where, you know, you're still really dependent on course flow and doing each obstacle in order and progressing like that. But you also have the benefits of the full course where you know that if you, you know, make a mistake, it happens, dust yourself off, get right back on the start line. Joe, what are your thoughts on this? Because right. you're, you're the only one here out of the three of us that's uh, actively competing and will be facing this format in the Premier Series. Right. Yeah, as an athlete, this sounds very exciting. And, I mean, I've been doing this, I don't even know how many years now, but like you said, right, you'd like that traditional uh, OG kind of sense of competition, like where if you fall, you're out. But as a competitor, right, like like you said, you want the best three people to be on the top podium, one, two, three. And a lot of competitions you go to, like you said, there's some really iffy, tricky things, and all it takes is, you know, an inch or a centimeter off from, you know, all your training for one year is gone. So I think this is going to be a really cool thing. I think it's going to have athletes training even harder right? Because they know that their training actually is going to matter, right? For the course. So this is pretty cool, right? Because you can go and, you know, if you, if you fall, fail an obstacle, right? You know that you have to train it better, right? Uh, and in this format, right? Because you have multiple tries at things and you can clearly see if you have the skill or not, or if you just whiff. And, you know, that's going to be really cool. And I think in other sports, right? You have basketball where, you have, you know, let's just say a famous basketball player, right, jumps up, takes a three-pointer, and hits the rim and bounces off, right? If he only got one shot that entire game, right, and missed that, you'd be like, well, this is terrible. Bro trains, you know, years and years, and he can't make one shot. And at the same time, you can have someone off the in the bleachers, not even like someone who plays basketball, just go for something, and they could get lucky, and it goes in. So that's almost kind of where, where some ninja competitions get to, where it gets so technical that they kind of lose sight of the actual training for the competition. And, you know, I think this will be really cool to see in the future, this new format. Joe, I'm honestly curious to know from your standpoint, Gauntlet 1 and Gauntlet 2 were very different courses. Gauntlet 1 was extremely pumpy. A lot of athletes were finishing in two, three minutes. Your guys were taking a lot of breaks. Um, I saw a number of you using up your full 45 seconds. And in the second Gauntlet, it seemed like, you guys were using none of your break, where it was just land onto the next obstacle. I'm sure. curious, from your perspective, which one did you enjoy more, and which ones did you feel were more entertaining of races? Sure. So the first gauntlet uh, didn't have that many rest platforms, right? So you kind of had to go from one obstacle straight to the next, straight to the next, and it, made, it was a little bit more tiring. The second gauntlet had a lot more platforms in it, so it definitely was like obstacle rest, obstacle rest. Even if you're not taking the rest, you're so dropping off and your hands are coming fully down uh, before you pop off or pop on to the next obstacle. So the first one was definitely harder strength-wise. Also, the rope was a little bit taller on the first one compared to the second one. So, but the, for competitor-wise, the second one was a lot more fun, actually. Because even though it was quicker, and that's not my style, I like, I like you know, going through things, you know, upper body pump. Uh, the second one was actually a lot of fun because uh, there's that one obstacle where you had to jump down to this wobbly thing and go up to a couple ropes, right? The and rooftop, yeah. Yeah, the rooftop. And the way that worked was you had to do a giant jump and two people jumped at the same time. So it kind of made it interesting, at least in my races, because there was a couple of things that happened if you go back and watch. Um, where it kind of affected the race, either it helped me get faster or slow me down. And yeah, as a, even as a, 
um, Spectator, right? The second gauntlet, I think, was more... Uh, it, it was more interesting to watch because there's a lot more happening. It's happening a lot faster. The race aren't races aren't as long. You don't see someone hanging there because as a spectator, right? You're just seeing someone hang for a couple minutes. You don't know what they're feeling. You know, you don't know anything about it. Where as a competitor, it's you know it's interesting because you know what they're feeling, but also you know it's taking forever at the same time. So the second gauntlet was a little bit more fun to compete in. And it was also more fun for the spectators to watch. Like, cause like I said, everything's happening fast. People are moving quick. Uh, there's obstacles that kind of decide, uh, how your run goes. Right. So yeah, I definitely think first gauntlet was really good for just the sheer, like upper body strength and endurance. But also the second one, now that I'm thinking about two people were also moving faster through that one. Because we also had an idea of what to train for leading up to it. The first guy mm. showed up yeah, with true. obstacles, right? And we ran them, and, you know, um, I'm sure you've known in your training, if you hit obstacles that you've never touched before, you might be over-gripping, or you might not know how something's feeling, so you're grabbing really hard or not as much, and, you know, maybe things are slick because they're new. Uh, where the second one, you kind of knew how everything felt. You've hit it a bunch of times. You've even trained for it. You've set up stuff for it. So those exact muscles in your body are going to work out regularly. So when you show up, it's almost like just like training, right? So that's that's another reason why people are moving a lot faster because they kind of know what to expect and what to train for going into it. Now, between the two tournaments and the two different styles, um, which one would you rather see similarities to, I guess? Wh- which one would you like Premier Series to be more like, the first gauntlet or the second gauntlet? Course-wise. Mm, course-wise? From a from a training standpoint and an athletic standpoint, I'd probably say the first one. Even though it's not as entertaining, uh, it was. I feel like you could show your skills a lot more. Because, say for example, you would go through uh, the last race on Gauntlet. Perfect example. Uh, me and Yuri were racing. Uh, it was a really good race. We were like right next to each other, and then I think Yuri missed one of the grabs or something. And because of how the obstacle worked. Um, it just took him out because the course was so fast that one mistake cost him the entire run. Like it wasn't even, it wasn't close. Right. And so as for, as a training perspective, that's kind of rough to have all your runs based on one move, uh, which is kind of similar to what you guys said about this new format. You want something where, uh, if you miss one move, you can go up and do it again, or you have another course going. Right. So just looking at that, right, if if I were going as to miss one move, like I guess in my race, me and Tom were running, Tom grabbed both the ropes, I had to wait there for the ropes, and I had to make up, you know, five, six seconds right there, otherwise it wasn't going to work out, so it definitely was a lot harder to make up a mistake, and if you guys are looking for something where your training goes right into the competition, right, it's the same, then I'd say you want something similar to the first gauntlet where your strength would matter more than, uh, you know, missing one tiny move or something like that. Uh, but also the first gauntlet was slow. So I feel like a good balance of, of both would be good, right? Like something where maybe you have more platforms at the beginning, but towards the end of the course, it really drops off. And maybe the obstacles are even a little bit harder. Like the cliff, led, cliff ledges are smaller, maybe more throws, maybe the ropes higher. Um, you know, stuff to pump you out really towards the end so that you get that, uh, you get that from an audience perspective, someone's going really fast through the beginning and the middle and towards the end, it starts getting slower. Well, they've already watched you run for, you know, 45 seconds or a minute, possibly up to there. So they're definitely entertained. And towards the end of it, I mean, it's exciting if you're right at the end and it starts getting really hard. So I feel like a, like a perfect in between would probably be best, at least as an athlete to look for. Because you don't want something too technical, too fast, but you also don't want something that takes forever and it's boring for people to watch and, you know, yeah, you know. And I, and I feel like in that case where you were saying that really plays into the strategy as well, trying to go fast uh, on the early obstacles so that you have more time to rest for the harder obstacles at the end um, compared to somebody who, you know, is, has fallen behind. You know, maybe you're on the platform at the same time, but you got there 15 seconds faster, and now you're you know shaking out and loose, whereas the other person is gasping because they just finished. Right, and if it's right at the end, that gets real exciting because I mean the whole race that you just watched, you know that fast version depends on this last part. You know who really has the most strength, who's trained the most for this, 
and that comes down to the last part right there. So that'll be entertaining for audiences too, as well as the competitors, right? Because if you've trained hard for it and you get to the end, you're like, this is great. I'm not even tired. I can just go. Then, you know, your training's paid off for the event. You know, from a spectator standpoint, you want to see a race that is competitive throughout is what I guess I should say. Yes. And, and, and to, I don't think we need to clarify because we went over the format, but I'll clarify anyways for people watching. It's not racing for the qualifiers. We're not racing each other. It's just leaderboard, standard leaderboard competition. Premier Series is not head-to-head. Right. But, you know, the uh, the sentiment still stands. You know, we want it to be... Right. I mean, you, you want to see... And the one thing I like about Premier Series in that sense um, is that on the placement course, you know, we're going to see, in theory, the strongest athletes run last. And, you know, that provides a great challenge because you know say you know oh well you know that there's a really strong time but we still have joe meisner run so you know this time could fall at any second you know we've seen in so many situations in ninja where we see some like ridiculous time or ridiculous score get put up and somebody else hasn't even run yet you know so from that perspective um like, there's not really anything else like that in sports. The closest thing I can think of is golf, where, like, okay, well, he's two shots back, but he still has five more holes to play, and, you know, he can get some birdies down the stretch. Um, but, like, this is a case of, you know, a golfer goes out, plays 18 holes, and then the next golfer goes and plays 18 holes, and you don't even know what the next guy is going to put up. So I, I think we are, you know, unique in that sense where we do, you know, build that drama over time. Absolutely. I'm going to, I'm going to brag a little bit. The placement thing was kind of my idea. So there we go. It was, it was originally, it was originally, I think I can say this. It was originally meant to be skills that would place everybody. Uh, it ended up being changed to flow course, which I think, I think is going to be really nice. I like, I think the thing that we didn't really fully address um, you know, jitters can be an absolute problem uh, early on. And I, I think that this placement course is going to be a, a great opportunity for people to shake out the nerves. Even if they if they mess up early on, it's not the end of the competition for them. They're, you know, going to have to run earlier in the run order um, on the course that's actually, for, the, the course that actually matters, I guess, if, if we're going to say that. Well, but, I mean, certainly, you know, athletes that go later, I mean, this is like the number one thing we hear about. Right. Somebody who for years was largely responsible for run orders. I heard it more than anyone else. Not that I'm bitter or anything. But, um, you know, naturally, if you run later in the course, you You have have seen more people do it. And, you know, somebody in the middle of the day is going to come up with something crazy. And it's like, oh, wow, yeah, I should have done that. Like, um, I'm trying to think of a good example that isn't Monstro Swing, but, um, like, uh, our friend Philip, who static the Monstro Swing in right. Hartford, like, if he would have done that in the first wave, who knows how many more people would have cleared that obstacle. Um, you know, I, we saw, using another example, uh, a couple of different techniques on Aerial Barrel, yes. where some people would go you know, was shaved directly sideways. But then later on, you saw more prevalently where they would essentially do a 180, and I'm trying to do a ballet routine on a bar stool, but um, they would, I called it the claw grip, where you kind of lache off, and then your front hand becomes the new back hand. So your hand is right there, and it's not nearly as technical of a move because then you're, you're essentially only really moving with one hand. Um, and we saw that become more prevalent over time and then more and more people started clearing it and naturally in the world championship we try to have it so that um, you know the in theory the better competitors run last but in this case we know that the strongest competitors on at least the placement course are going to run last right. they're going to get that advantage and we've seen that so much in like stages two and three the last two years in the elite division the last and Honestly, I should just use this as the example in the first place. The last two years, the last athlete to run stage three won the world championship. 
Yep. In the one thing that sticks out to me uh, was two years ago in Center Court uh, when, when Elite Male was running Stage Three, you had a massive cliff line that, that you got to go through, and you know the the deeper we got into the run order, the faster everyone was going through exactly. the cliffhangers, and that's not to say that the people who were going earlier were worse because they weren't. The, these are the these are the best of the best. Um, they knew but they, they knew they they knew what their time limit was essentially, and they were getting more and more efficient. And that was that was a huge huge deciding factor in in not just the world champion but the podium. Right, and from a, an athletic perspective, right? If you're watching, you know, if you're sixth in the run order and you watch five other people go, like you said, they're going to get faster and faster because not only do they know the time they have to beat, they're also realizing that. Uh, as an athlete, you show up to a course, right? You, you see new obstacles, and you may not always know how they feel, or maybe you'll go a little bit slower because maybe you'll get to a cliffhanger and be like, oh, you know what? This doesn't feel how I thought it would. It's harder, and some people might go and fall, right? But if you're seeing that people are getting through it, right, just fine, that gives almost some confidence to you before you run that you shouldn't hold back at all, right? You should just go for it because if they made it through, then you should be fine to go everything that you have, right, to make it through. And there, there's nothing really to, you know, if, 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 if you are doing monster swing, this is a perfect example, right? If the first three people go and they grab and they slide right off, then you're like, all right, well, I expect it to be super slippery, so I'm going to take my time there and make sure I get through. Where if the first three people grabbed it and stuck and went through, in your mind, you wouldn't even be thinking if it's going to be slippery or not because you saw other people get through it and you have that confidence that you're just going to go and get through it faster, right? So I think that also plays a part in it. It gives a little bit of confidence for some competitors. Um, well, with that, I mean, Joe, we're talking a lot, of, a lot of game about Premier Series, but we still have one more crucial, crucial step before that. We got the World Championships. How are you feeling coming into that? I feel good. Um, we've just been running a lot of courses here at the gym, and World Championship isn't really hard strength wise. So we're just training a lot of technical. Uh, Noted. Random stuff. <laughs> I was about to say he's calling us out. He's putting us on the spot here. No, I'm just saying, right, compared to some other courses, Scotland, for example, when you get done with that, your arms are burning. Uh, but uh, I, I guess I've never done well in Worlds either, right? I've never gone far enough to get that pump. I've tested stuff and it wasn't hard, wow. but. Uh, you know, maybe there, maybe there's the extra pressure that uh, maybe maybe arms will get tired. But uh, there's also only so much you can do in 120 feet. Yeah. You know? Of course, yeah, and I know it's challenging as a course designer too. And uh, yeah, so training wise, we're just training a lot of technical throws and uh, some jumps, some balance, and yeah, just really a lot of cliches. I mean, you yeah. Know, but you're good. you're someone that I I we know, and and I think a lot of other people know. You're someone who's fully capable. Of winning the title it's just going to come down to you know how's it going to be on that day um so i wish you the absolute best of luck it's going to be uh it's going to be a great event guys june 23rd to the 25th with uh, a competition for international competitors and staff at level up on the 22nd i'm great at advertising things guys i'm so, really so good at promoting at it's least. almost like they should hire you to i know it's almost like they they need me to content. The international competition is fun to watch too. If you're in the area, if you're there a day early, for sure, yeah. Yep. And up and watch it. I've I've never met an international athlete I don't like. I always enjoy so much catching up with them, and they are so incredibly nice, and they love meeting American fans. So yeah, you I guys, think all three of us can speak for how awesome the international. You have no idea how, how excited I am, dude. I'm I'm so excited to like actually that's, be there. That's your home. It's my home gym. And so not only am I going to, you know, be there to help out because there's going to be, you know, like early registration there as well, but I'm going to be doing commentary for the competition and I'm going to get to, it's just going to be so cool. And I, I've been, I've been a fan of Ninja, not just here or anything, but Ninja around the world for a long time now. I think honestly, before I hit puberty, like genuinely, like my, my voice, I think it's true of all three of them. yeah, it's been, it's been crazy. So the idea of everyone coming in um, and and actually getting to compete, and I'm, I'm going to be right there. I'm like, dude, that's crazy. It's, it's awesome. I'm so excited. I get to do commentary for their runs. I, I don't know 
what exactly I'll be doing at Worlds yet, but I know for that I'll you know I I, have I, the opportunity. I can tell you from experience it never gets old. It's gonna be so cool. I also really enjoyed the sound of my own voice at this podcast. Anything <laughs> to judge by? We couldn't tell. <laughs> Uh, with that, I think we're going to wrap the episode. Joe, do you have any uh, final advice, uh, words of advice for anybody out there who's well, maybe thanks. looking looking for wor- worlds or premiere series or anything, really? Sure. As an athlete, final advice, discipline, right? Every day, you got to train no matter what. doesn't matter if you don't feel like it. doesn't matter if you're sick. Train, right? Build that discipline. And if you get this, get to a slump where you're not growing or you're falling on little things, right? discipline right do it every day you'll start increasing you'll get better go chop some wood you'll get some uh bicep yeah stuff. chop some wood right and definitely have fun with it right don't forget to have fun and uh don't think of it just as like don't just do competitions right um like the international qualifier the best part of that is afterwards right everyone playing together everyone set up different moves challenges and just going for it right and that's the most fun part so yeah train every day discipline right and have fun with it and do your best words to live by thanks so much for watching guys we'll see you guys in the next episode and uh i'll see both of you gentlemen at worlds all right let's go can't wait see you soon man we came up with something that's kind of between our flow course and our full course um we have the placement course which everybody's going to get to run that decides the seating for the, oh god, I forgot the name, competition course, somebody stop me, but there's the, like, actual competition, yeah, this is not going good. No, it's the challenge course. Challenge, challenge course, thank you, mm, challenge skill, I'm going to change the challenge skill, okay, for real, for real, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. I'm ready. Take, take six, take six. Take six.